Laboratory 40 focuses on the ELISA. The main concept here is to learn how to use primary and secondary antibodies as a way to detect certain antigens present. Here, the rapid ELISA test will be used to detect six different samples to see if for the presence of possible primary antibodies being produced. So we will set up using an ELISA plate or a 96 well plate that has been already coated with an antigen and some properties that allow it to be detected. And into those, we will add several different samples, add a primary antibody, a secondary antibody, and a chromogen to see if those particular wells produce a positive response. So the setup is as follows. We'll take the plate to each of the wells. We'll add, in this case, a positive control, a negative control, as well as the six possible samples, A through F. Once they are added in triplicate to the actual plate, we will then proceed to ask the first, second, and third set of substances, which are the primary, secondary antibodies, and the third, this case being the chromophore and chromogen substance. So let's set this up. We want to first open up the samples just so to make it a little bit easier for us to test. We will be adding three drops of each in triplicate. We just added our positive control, so we'll put it off to the side so we don't confuse it. And right next to it, we'll add our negative control. We will also put this off to the side so as to not contaminate it. Now we'll take each of the possible samples that could have been infected. Also in triplicate. We'll take our second possible sample. In the last three wells. And then we'll continue with the last four. We will skip a line to make it a little bit easier to detect easier to visualize, but ideally, each of these plates contains the antigen of interest that has already been coated upon the wells, and if any of these samples already possess an antibody to it, they'll immediately complex with it. So this time that we're letting pass gives it a little bit of time to do so. Proceeding with our last set of samples. Three drops each, which ends up representing roughly about 150 microliters. And then we have our final patient. Ideally here, these samples are complexing with the antigen present if they do have the primary antibodies. So usually we can move this a little bit just so we can get complex a little bit faster. And now we can proceed with all the tests. The idea here is that we're gonna take now our primary, secondary, which contains an active enzyme, and our chromogen to be able to observe the test. 
So now for a little bit of the longer period of assaying, we will take our primary antibody and add three drops to each and every single one of the cells or wells that we actually added our sample to. It's being careful to track every single well as we apply it. Three drops each. And just for the sake of keeping track of it, we're going through six by six wells. And then what we'll proceed to do is allot it some amount of time for now the active primary antibody that we're using to interact with the other complex that just formed. The idea here is that if there is a primary antibody interacting with the antigen, this primary antibody will be able to detect it. Now, as we can't visualize this, we'll have to use a different method to observe it. So allow this complex to happen. And now, the way we can observe it is by concentrating it by using a secondary antibody that possesses a proprietary enzyme that will change color if we provide it with some reactants. So the same premise here, every well will get three drops. Pausing at every six just to keep track of it. Ideally here, the secondary antibody will only interact with the primary that we added if the antigen and the other antibody complex first. So there's no possibility of a false positive. Typically, we can rinse these out and empty them, but because each of these antibodies is designed to complex specifically to a particular condition, we don't need to even rinse these out. So now, the primary and the secondary antibodies have been added. If a particular state happens to be positive for them, they'll have complexed, leaving anything that is unbound to not interact or cause any reactions. So we'll mix this up a little bit more. And then the final piece will be to add the chromogen that only if the presence of the enzyme that has already been complex between the secondary and the primary antibodies have occurred, a change will allow this to be converted. So take the chromogen and cleave it into a chromophore. Now, since this is a rapid test, the reactions do occur relatively quickly, and so we'll start seeing changes in color as we start proceeding through these. The most obvious of them all will be the positive control, which is meant to demonstrate for the presence of all of these three drops in each as well. And then the negative control, which are the other three wells, should not change in color. Now, to add it to the actual samples. 
three drops for all. And in this case, we'll try and keep them as close as possible to prevent any influence of time. And now for the last six. We'll also agitate it just a little bit. Give it a little bit of a shake. the reaction to proceed. So normally these tests are measured using either UV light or some sort of spectrophotometry to be able to observe the changes, but since this one changes in color, we can actually see it or visualize it pretty quickly. So as the test begins to turn positive, we'll start observing a change in color. And based on the intensity, we'll be able to tell which quality of interaction of the antibodies have occurred. So we'll continue to let it sit. We can read this up to five minutes. Beyond that, it's possible that it could produce a false positive. Small amount of agitation will help. And we can start observing the data. Just as our clarification, we'll be able to provide that we had our positive controls up here, our negatives, and then we had patient A, B, C, D, E, and F. And that concludes the test. So now we'll have images to provide you so you can actually do the final analysis.